Thank you, man. Those songs are awesome. I just wrote some of the words down while they were singing them. Because if, if you're in Christ, these are true of you. And even during this time, these times that we're in our culture, uh, Josiah saying, your world's not falling apart. It's falling into place. Because God says, I'm, I'm still on the throne, and you're not alone. God's got this time and the situation. And uh, Nathaniel saying, I'm forgiven, I'm accepted, I'm alive and well, your spirit lives inside of me, because Jesus died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, would die for me? And it's my joy to honor you. Those are awesome words to great songs. Thank you, son. You know, a few years ago, on a hot summer day, in South Florida, this was on the news, a little boy decided to go for a swim in the old swimming hole behind his house. In a hurry to dive into the cool water, he ran out the back door, shoes and socks and shirt was being shed as he went along, he flew into the water. He didn't realize that as he was swimming toward the middle of the lake, an alligator was swimming toward him to get to the shore. His mother was in the house looking out the window and saw the two as they got closer together. And in utter fear, she ran outside toward the water, yelling to her son as loudly as she could. And hearing her voice, the little boy became alarmed and turned around and began swimming back toward the dock toward his mother. But it was too late. As he was reaching out to her, the alligator reached him. And from the dock, the mother grabbed her little boy's arms just as the alligator snagged his legs. And that began, that began an incredible tug of war between the two. The alligator was much stronger than the mother. But the mother was much too passionate and determined to ever let go. Thankfully, a farmer happened by about that time and heard her screams and raced from his pickup truck with his rifle and from the bank took aim and shot the alligator. And remarkably, after weeks and weeks in the hospital, the little boy did survive. His legs were extremely scarred by the vicious attack of the animal, and on his arms were deep scratches where his mother's fingernails dug into his flesh in her effort to hang on to the son whom she loved. The newspaper reporter who interviewed the boy after the trauma asked if, if he could see the scars. The boy lifted up his pants leg and and with obvious pride, he also said to the reporter, but, but look here also at my arms. I have great scars in my arms because I have a mother who would not let go. The boy was the recipient of the determined love of his mother. His life was intersected by the alligator, but also intersected by a loving 
determined mother. You know, that picture is God for all of us. We are on a tough journey. And at times, there's many dangerous things out here wanting to gobble us up. You might even be able to recall a time in your own journey, maybe even this time, where you realize that but God's not going to let go of you. In spite of being seriously pulled into another direction, God's got a hold of us. So what is your journey like? Really, what is your journey like? What's your life like? What, what came to your mind when I asked that question? How, how would you describe your own journey, your own life, to somebody that asked you? Have you, there been times in your life where you need to be rescued? Do you have a few scars, physically, emotionally, or mentally, from those times that you need to be rescued? Does your journey include an intersection on your path with God? How did God reveal himself to you at that time? And how does God show you now his love and faithfulness and, and determination toward you? And at that intersection where you realized God was coming into focus for you, did you just continue on your path and, and let God go his way? Or did you align yourself with God's path? And at that intersection, it changed everything for you. These are just some questions to consider as we look today at a few other journeys in the scripture. We're going to take a look at other people's journeys. There's lots of them in the scriptures, but we're just going to take a quick look at four different people. And the first glimpse we're going to look at is part of the journey that Zacchaeus was on in the New Testament. Everything we know about Zacchaeus comes from Luke chapter 19. I'm just going to read that. You follow along. Luke chapter 19. There's just 10 verses. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief chief tax collector, and he was rich, and he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd, and Zacchaeus was of short stature. So he ran ahead, and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus, and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down. For today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received Jesus joyfully. But when the others saw it, they all complained, saying, Jesus has gone to be the guest with a man who is a sinner. Jesus stood, I'm sorry, then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I will give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anybody by false accusation, I will restore them fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's just a glimpse of Zacchaeus' life. In fact, it's probably just one day, a part of one day. But here's what we can know about Zacchaeus from these ten verses. Zacchaeus was a short, wealthy, chief tax collector from Jericho who could run and climb. Zacchaeus was seeking Jesus to see who he was. And in order to see Jesus through the crowd, Zacchaeus had to run ahead, climb up a sycamore tree, and be able, just to be able to get a glimpse of him as he passed by. And when Jesus and the crowd finally made it up to the sycamore tree where Zacchaeus was sitting, Jesus looked up and his eyes met Zacchaeus. And Jesus actually spoke directly to Zacchaeus and knew his name. Zacchaeus, make haste. Come down, for today I must stay at your house. And Zacchaeus came down from the tree and received joyfully Jesus into his home. We also know that Zacchaeus called Jesus Lord and repented of his wrongdoings, and he promised to make restitution for money that he took wrongly from others. And the account from Luke 19 ends with Jesus saying this about Zacchaeus. Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Maybe there's a part of your journey, maybe there's a glimpse of your journey that looks a little bit like Zacchaeus's. You know, you might not be, you may or may not be short, you may or may not be wealthy, you may or may not be a tax collector, you may or may not be good at running or climbing, but you might be at least interested enough to seek Jesus out 
a bit, like Zacchaeus was. You might have heard about Jesus and now want to see him for yourself. And you may no longer want to just blend in with the crowd. You might actually want to expend energy to separate from the cloud to get a good look at Jesus. And you might be one who, like Zacchaeus, wants to receive Jesus joyfully into your home and into your life. My encouragement to you <coughs> is just do it. Like Zacchaeus did. Do what it takes to get a closer look at Jesus. You're not going to regret it. Start reading the New Testament. <coughs> Start reading the Gospels, and as, as you get a glimpse, if you get a serious look of Jesus, you'll find, just like Zacchaeus found, that Jesus is already looking at you. He already knows your name. Let your eyes meet him. Let your heart be drawn to him. And hear Jesus say to you, hey, make haste. I'm going to come to your house. I'm going to come to your life today. Though very likely not an exact match, there might be some similarities to Zacchaeus' journey at least to parts of your own journey. Seek out Jesus. That's Zacchaeus. Now let's take a quick glimpse at a Pharisee's journey. This is the chapter earlier, Luke 18. I'm going to be reading 914. Listen closely about the Pharisee and see if there's any parallels in this person's life with your own life. It starts in verse 9. Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and that I'm not even like this tax collector here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. But the tax collector stood afar off, and he would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast, and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this second man went down to his house justified rather than the first. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So let's, let's see what we know about the Pharisee from this passage. We know the Pharisee went up to the temple. He went to the house of God to pray. He stood up as he prayed. And it says he prayed simply thus to himself. He was proud. He even thanked God that he was not like other men. He boasted that he wasn't guilty of extortioning. He wasn't unjust. He hadn't committed adultery. And he boasted that he wasn't even like this sinning tax collector who was standing afar off. He then boasted in his prayer about his religious accolades. He said he fasted twice a week. He gave a tenth of all that he had to the religious leaders of the temple. Verse 9 starts out that this was a self-righteous man who despised others. And Jesus said this religious man who boasted in his prayers with himself was not justified in the eyes of God. Jesus said this man who exalted himself with his prayer and with his life, he would be humbled at last and not be justified. That's what we know about the Pharisee. Maybe you're like this Pharisee today. Maybe you even go to church and pray. Maybe you stand up and pray mostly to yourself. Maybe you're proud that you're not like other sinners. Maybe you've never committed serious sexual sin. Maybe you've not been unjust or an extortioner. Maybe you can even boast about your religious expressions. Maybe you do give 10% of all you have. Maybe you do fast twice a week. Maybe you're at the church building every time the doors are open. But you know what? You might not be trusting Jesus. You might not be embracing him. You might not be humbled. You might not be justified in the eyes of God. If you can identify at least in part with where this Pharisee was at, my encouragement to you would be to consider the parallels of your own journey with the journey of this Pharisee. Do you see tendencies in your own life that are revealed in this Pharisee's life? Kind of a false pretense, a religious thing, but not a real relationship. And if you see some parallels there, my, my uh, advice to you would be to consider the next person. We've looked at Zacchaeus. We've looked at this Pharisee. Now we're going to look at another tax collector. It seems like there's a lot of tax collectors in the New Testament, doesn't it? 
This is the story of another tax collector. In fact, we just read it from Luke 18. This is the other guy that went to the temple to pray that day. Let's remember from that story what we know about him. This is a parable. Remember, a parable is an illustration that Jesus makes to make, that he gave to make a point. And here's what we know about this tax collector. Just like the Pharisee, this tax collector went up to the temple to the house of God to pray. The tax collector stood afar off from the others. In humility, he couldn't even get himself to look up to pray. And he beat his breast, maybe in disappointment with his own life, but he beat his breast as he prayed. And his prayer was simple, to the point, and very personal. In sincerity, he prayed a simple seven-word prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He acknowledged he needed mercy. He acknowledged the Lord was God. And he acknowledged he was a sinner. Notice also Jesus said that this sinner, this tax collector, went down to his house justified. Jesus said this man who humbled himself with his prayer and with his countenance and likely with his life would now be exalted and justified in the eyes of God. Maybe you're like this tax collector today. You might or might not pray at a church or a house of God. You might or might not feel comfortable praying. You might stand afar off when you do pray. It may be a very personal thing to you. You might not even look up when you pray. You might even beat your breast or have a measured disappointment when you realize the mistakes and the sins that you've done in your own life. But all people, including this man, can humble ourselves. We can all humble ourselves. And we can pray earnestly and sincerely as this man prayed. And honestly, all people can sincerely pray this prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We can all humble ourselves. We can all see our need for God's mercy. We can all receive forgiveness. And then, according to Jesus, we can be exalted. We can be forgiven. We can receive mercy. Because God, our loving, kind Father in heaven, delights in showing his mercy and forgiving us because that's why he sent his son to pay for our sins. My encouragement to you, if you consider this journey of the tax collector parallel in some ways to your own journey, then humble yourself and ask God for his mercy like this man did. He will forgive your sins. He said he would. So we've looked at Zacchaeus, we've looked at the Pharisee, we've looked at this other tax collector, and now the last glimpse of a journey we're going to look at is the woman caught, caught in adultery in John chapter 8. Listen closely to a glimpse of this woman's journey, and just see if there's any parallels with your own journey. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to Jesus a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that we should stone such as these. But what do you say? This they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him for. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he didn't hear. So they continued asking him. And when they continued asking him, he raised himself back up. And this is what he said. He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their own consciences, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And Jesus raised himself up again, and he saw no one there but the woman. And he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Here's what we know about this woman in this situation from the passage. The scribes and Pharisees brought this woman to Jesus. They set her down right in the middle of the group. They explained to Jesus that she was caught in the very act of adultery. 
There was no disputing it. They reminded Jesus that the Old Testament command was to now stone her to death. And the whole thing was a setup. So that the scribes and Pharisees could test Jesus and ultimately accuse him of something wrong. Jesus knew what they were up to, and he first just stooped down, appeared to ignore them, and he wrote something on the ground. So they continued asking him, and he stood back up and he declared, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Then he stooped back down and he continued writing on the ground. Those standing there, after hearing Jesus' words and watching him write on the ground, they were convicted, it says, by their own consciences. And they left. Interesting enough, they left. The oldest one left on down to the youngest one till they all left. And when Jesus was gone, he stands back up from his writing. And he asked the woman, woman, where are those accused of yours? Has no one condemned you? And the woman says, Lord, no one. And then Jesus tell her, tells her that neither does he condemn her, and she's to go and sin no more. I'm looking forward someday to find out in heaven. You know, we always say things we want to find out in heaven. I'd love to know what he wrote on the ground that day. Sometimes I guess that maybe he wrote the sins of the men that had brought this woman there. Maybe he listed out their sins. Maybe he listed out the times they committed adultery with the names of the people they committed adultery with. Whatever it was, the Lord's words and his countenances and his activity convicted him in their conscience. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what that exactly was someday. But, but they were condemned anyway and left and no longer uh, were able to condemn this woman. You know, your life might parallel this woman or intersect with this woman, at least a glimpse of it. You know, you may or may not be guilty of, of sexual sin. That's not uncommon in our culture. You may feel condemned by those around you because of your sinful choices like this woman felt. You might be standing in your life now like her, wondering what Jesus is going to do to you and what's he going to say to you as these men drug her over there. You may have a sense eventually that it's only you and Jesus, and you may have a desire to embrace him and call him Lord. You may recognize that Jesus is the true Lord and decide to trust him, even while still maybe being uncertain about your current situation. You might need to hear that Jesus shed his blood to pay for your sins and to free you from condemnation. You might need to hear Jesus say to you, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more with my power. You know, if you find yourself identifying with this woman's journey and you see similarities in your own journey, my encouragement to you would be just what she did. Look to Jesus. See what a loving, kind Lord he is. He came to free you from condemnation. He came to free you from sin. He made the necessary payment for every one of your sins, asking for his forgiveness. Turn from your sin, like he told the woman to do. Turn to him and trust him, embrace him. Welcome him into your life. Welcome him into your home. Let him change you, cleanse you, empower you to live a life free from sin. Embrace this God who came for you. You know, five chapters earlier, John chapter 3, Jesus explains in his own words that John recorded that he didn't come into the world to condemn the world. Jesus explains that the world was already condemned before he came. He came to save the world from condemnation. The world, including this woman who was caught in adultery, actually included the scribes and the Pharisees that brought her there, actually including me and all of us. Everybody has sinned. We've all chosen to do wrong things in the dark, things that we knew better. And because of our sinful choices, we stand condemned. We need forgiveness, and we need to be rescued from the condemnation because of our sins. This alligator of condemnation and punishment for our sins is chasing us down, and we're swimming toward the bank need to be rescued, like the boy in the story. The woman caught in adultery was exposed. Her sins were brought to light. She was brought to Jesus. She called him Lord. He didn't condemn her. He instructed her to go and sin no more. So there's our four journeys. 
We got Zacchaeus, the Pharisee, the tax collector, and the woman caught in adultery. Each one unique, each one different, just like our own individual lives. We're, we intersect with people all the time, but we're all on our own journey. And there's hundreds of others in the Bible. You can look at any individual in the Bible and, and look at a glimpse of their journey in time. And oftentimes you'll see where their life intersects with God. And you're able to see whether they continue their own way or whether they start going God's way. Zacchaeus, in one day, goes from seeking just to get a look at Jesus to have Jesus coming right into his house and completely change him because of his intersection with Jesus. The Pharisee, in one trip to the temple, prays, boasts, exalts himself, then goes home unchanged, unjustified, and unmoved by his intersection with God. He continues on. The tax collector, in one, trip, in one trip to the temple on one day, prays, humbles himself, humbles himself, quietly asks God for mercy, acknowledges he's a sinner, and according to Jesus, goes home justified and completely changed because of his intersection with God and going the way of the Lord. The woman caught in adultery in one day, at one moment, caught in the very act, condemned by the religious leaders, brought to Jesus, almost stoned to death, acknowledges Jesus as Lord, sees Jesus rescue her, and receives forgiveness. And receives instructions from Jesus to go and sin no more. And she goes home completely changed because of this intersection with God and not ruling his way. <clears throat> Your journey may have similarities with these four. Or it may be completely, totally different. But the fact is that you and I are definitely on our journey. And we are also in great need to have an intersection with God and to meet Jesus and to be forgiven and to be empowered, and to be justified, and to be completely changed. My encouragement is to seek Jesus out. Come to Jesus. Read his word, the Bible. Pray to him. Get a glimpse of him. If you are sincere in your pursuit of him and seeking to know him, you will find when you intersect with him that he's already looking at you. He already knows your name. He's already accomplished what needs to be accomplished to forgive you of your sins. You know, just like that boy down in Florida, once you reach out to grab the Lord to be rescued by him, you will find him unwilling to let go of you. No matter what is pulling you the other way, and there'll be pulls from the other way. Most earnest journeys, people who reached out and are rescued by Jesus like this, they will have scars from forces pulling in both directions. But you know what? What most uh, true Christians discover, these scars become a beautiful reminder, a beautiful testimony of a God who will not give in and God who will not let go if you're earnestly seeking to be rescued by him. I'd like to close in prayer. Father, I thank you that you are on the throne. We are not alone. You see, you hear, and you desire to rescue us. Lord, any loving father or mother would do what we heard about that story today, rescue her child from the jaws of an alligator. How much more a loving, kind father in heaven would answer to those who say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Father, rescue me from my current situations. Thank you that we can have confidence because you are a loving, kind Father, because you've already accomplished the payment of sins by sending your son Jesus to shed his blood and to rise again, that we can have confidence to come before you and say, Father, I agree with you. I'm in need of rescuing. I'm in need of forgiveness. I'm in need of cleansing. And I am calling out to you now to forgive me, to rescue me, to change me. And to 
I would pray, just, why don't you just go ahead and pray quietly to the Lord yourself if you like. Just pray something simple like this. Lord, I need you. I need you to change me. I need your forgiveness. I need you to come into my life. I need you to come into my home. I need you to change me. Would you please come in, Jesus, and make me into the person that you want me to be and rescue me from my own sins and from my own bad choices and the situation I'm in now. I need you, Lord, and I'm asking you to, to come in and change me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and are earnest and sincere with it, God will be faithful.